sensibility. That's a real pain. That's been a real pain in my life, all, all my life, trying to explain what instability means. It's not been easy. So I'm going to cover a little bit the past, the present, and the future. Past. Well, the first time that uh, somebody <coughs> used the word stability for to refer to the carpels, uh, it was uh, this guy, Constantin Lambrinudi. Nobody knew him much better than uh, Gilford and, and Bolton. Uh, those were their fellows, actually. They got the publication, but actually the publication was based on their recollections of the spirit of uh, Lambrinudi explaining what stability was. Prior to that, uh, there have been some descriptions by the thought on what the uh, instability was, but that, uh, they didn't use that word. And the word stability, it was really um, cumbersome. Later, it was uh, Geoffrey Fisk, uh, the one that had, who took over this, this term, to explain that the risk was a link system with a tendency of collapsing in a zigzag fashion. That was pretty much okay. If, uh, if it was used for ski foot fractures. But for uh, ski foot net, uh, dissociations or ligament ruptures, it was difficult to understand until those guys uh, got serious on that and I say, okay, uh, we can have a situation where the, the wrist has not sustained load because there is a ligament rupture. And they were uh, putting very carefully the names so that they talk about malalignment leading to uh, instability. Not that malalignment was exactly the same as instability, which is the problem. That, that was the problem. Uh, in fact, they told us that no less or no more than 8 to 12 percent of the cases with a malaligned wrist were actually unstable. And that was the problem the, that the people didn't read that paper well. It was a problem. And that was uh, Cibo Lake. For those who have been in Rochester, Cibo Lake is a beautiful place, as you can see. And if I was uh, to place a message here, I would say, okay, if you are in it, so it, that's okay. But if you do it, do it right. Do it right and plant a seed in the most fertile soil. Uh, do not waste your time uh, throwing the seed in the swamp. You need a good soil, and there was no good soil in this world to take their seed. Look at what they think. This is uh, 2000, by the way, uh, 2016. Carpal ligament is defined as any malalignment of the corpus. And that was a problem. If you think that any malaligned wrist is unstable, you're not doing a good job here. You're not to understanding what's going on between the unstable and the stable. And I say, well, this is unstable, this is stable. The house, of course, is stable. it's unstable there because by just pushing a little bit, a little bit vibration, a little bit of wind, whatever, it falls down. On the right-hand side, those cars are completely stable, even though they are malaligned. So between malalignment and stability, there's nothing in common. Or maybe some in common because they are very unstable situations, like this one that I, obtain uh, the same alignment by just removing one car. How could I? By just using some tape. The only possibility of gaining some stability there. So stability and malalignment are not the same. The present. The present started when I had uh, asked, I was asked uh, to review and to, to renew the, the chapter of uh, risk instability. This is my senior partner, Alberto Luke, and he was the one that uh, encouraged me to clarify specifically what instability was as opposed to misalignment or dislocation. And in that, uh, in that work, uh, started by Jess, as anybody else, we, worked, we looked into the Wesp Webster uh, Dictionary. They say, not likely to follow. Not likely to follow or give way. That's a good, good uh, discussion of uh, of cases that I like this one. If there, if there is no way that, that that risk can sustain load without yielding, that's not stable. But there's another meaning to it. They propose another that says resistant to sudden change or deterioration. Resistant to sudden change. 
meaning what? Meaning, um, or, meaning uh, if there are sudden changes in motion, if one bone from one, uh, one position to another doesn't follow that smooth curve that it's normal for it, that's not stable. And we're using this definition to, to say that there are uh, inst unstable wrists that clunk. And we make it uh, also another mistake. We make the relationship between clunking and instability. In a way, we thought, okay, there are two meanings that we need, uh, we need to consider. One derives from the verb to stand, and the other one from the verb to stay. If it stays longer and longer, and it does move uh, without changes, that's stable. If it stands, if it's able to sustain load, it's stable again. But both, they both cannot match in most cases. Because you may have a biomechanic instability, kinetic or kinematic, and you have to have symptoms for this to be clinically meaningful. If that's it, and that's a definition that it's the current definition, if you look everywhere, this is the definition they are working with. Again, I'm not happy with this. I'm not happy with this uh, situation or definition. Because if it stays and at the same time it's to stand, what's the problem? What's the problem is that this is my daughter. <coughs> she's got a clunking breast, she's got a malaligned breast, but she has no symptoms. Mm -hmm. I say, okay, she's got no symptoms so that there's no clinical instability in this case. So we have something that it doesn't match. It's like an oxymoron. Should the Leaning Tower of Pisa be demolished? Is it unstable? <coughs> well, the Tower of Pisa, it's malaligned, but it's not unstable. So another problem. Is it a static malalignment? Is there stability in a static malalignment? I mean, we are getting into confusion here, isn't it? Where is this? Uh, well, those are crazy guys in my country. Uh, what, what they like to do is this. <laughs> is this a stable? Well, actually, not that much, but the, the, it's not stable. Uh, yeah, they, they fall. But, but, uh, but, you know, no much injury is caused. But because what they try is to go up there and go down without suffering injury. So in, in a way, they're trying to get an equilibrium, even though that's unstable equilibrium. Kinetically unstable, kinematically unstable. I mean, this is uh, unbearable. I mean, you cannot work all your time thinking, well, this is kinetically stable, yes, why? Uh, and, oh, no, I don't like it. And that's why we are talking now on something else. Tyranny of a gap. Uh, how many times we have said that uh, there's a tyranny, tyranny meaning uh, uh, if there is a gap, there must be something that needs to be fixed. To be or not to be is still. Because there's a bilateral skiff and diastasis. Again, the problem of trying to uh, define what stability is, is not easy. Aside from that, uh, you have injury or you have disease. This is a disease, the wrist obviously this is three. What to do with that gap? Is that gap meaningful? Of course not, because there's something more important behind arthritis, arthritis, I would say. The problem is that there are people suffering from these uh, lousy interpretation of facts. If there were not lousy interpretation of facts, or there were no casualties, I wouldn't mind. But this is what uh, bothers me. We are not harming things, we are not harming cadaver wrists, we are harming real people. We are harming spoolmen, we are harming entrepreneurs, we are harming workers and young people, and they will pay for our lousy interpretation of things. And that's why I decided today to come here and say, okay, we are, there's a lot of economical problems if we don't decide what the term instability is. And we should uh, treat meaningful instability cases. So, my proposition. I think that we should no longer use the term instability on vain. In vain is that uh, what uh, sounds like biblical, but we should talk more about this function. 
release this function. Uh, release this function is more the general term. It allows you to, to talk about many things. It allows to talk about the instability. There's also a normal abnormal mobility involved. There may be some misaligned cases, uh, clinical, uh, symptomatic, and asymptomatic. Everything can be under the umbrella of this function. Once you have accepted that, any dysfunction can be um, divided or uh, is a combination of one of the four uh, factors that are there. <coughs> Risk instability. Let's accept that there's only one definition of instability. Let's not uh, take two. It's not to stand and to say. It's only to stand. Something that stands, something that is able to carry load is stable. Only that. If it's not that, if it's a problem of uh, motion, let's talk about abnormal motion. It's much easier. The description is much better. These kinematics will get you. If there is any abnormal carpal motion, that's another problem. Different from instability. You may have an instability, you may have abnormal motion, but not both. Third, misalignment. Let's talk about carpal misalignment when there is an alteration of carpal alignment, when there are gaps, where step of the uh, joining congruity, whatever. This is another factor, but needs not to be necessarily implied that a misalignment is unstable or a misalignment has a dyskinematics, different thing. And finally, symptoms. For any reason, there are many cases that are unstable or are misaligned that do not cause symptoms. And if they do not cause symptoms like my daughter, they should not be treated. Again, and besides, uh, it, this is not like a Ben's uh, diagram that we may talk later this morning about the RUJ. This is something that the, the number of unstable risks is so little as compared to misalignment, or as compared to clinical symptom, symptomatic cases, or as compared to uh, cotton motion that we should not work on something that as if they were exactly the same. Disability is a very rare condition. Rare condition. And I'll say again, it's a very unusual condition. Besides, if it is a scheme of thoughts, uh, we start uh, full, uh, filling all these gaps with a little occurrence we are lost. I propose you to just break away from occurrence. We're wasting so much time on acronyms that we don't really <coughs> miss the point. We don't understand the carpus enough. In fact, in my opinion, if we follow this way, carpology will be that the study of the wrist and its many acronyms. <laughs> and, and this is not good. I mean, <laughs> this is not good. Um, why should we use acronyms that are useless? <coughs> is this slack 2 wrist? You probably you, you all agree with this that this is slack too. Believe me, where's the advanced collapse? Can you see an advanced collapse in this case? Why should we use a formula that says that it's an advanced collapse if it's not advanced collapse? Why not just describing things? Let's describe instability as the ability to sustain load. Let's describe uh, that uh, slack one by saying, oh, there's osteophrase in between the bridges and the Radial styloid or um, radius K photosteophrase. What's the problem? No problem. You describe and everybody understands. You say it's like three and everybody will have to take uh, that thing and say, okay, it's like three. Oh, that's, that, that's it. No. Let's move away from acronyms. The ones that we can. So, how to describe that? And stability, we have said it already. I'll jump over this. Uh, Wrist is kinetically unstable when it's enabled to bear physiologic loads. Everything okay. This is not physiologic. I know. I know, but uh, I know that uh, you are all aware that this building is unstable. Not only is unstable, they had to demolish. Otherwise, it was a serious problem with the, uh, for the people walking by. This is instability, inability to sustain load. This arch is a Roman arch. It's in my country. It's stable. It's been stable for ages, and still it can sustain all the troops coming all over that that arch. This is stability. This is stability, and nothing else. So, you can only be sure that this wrist is stable if the patient told you. If the patient tells you, okay, this wrist gives way when I'm using it. 
that's his stability. The stability there uh, cannot be measured with uh, millimeters of gap. Actually, we, th we shouldn't care much about the gap. We shouldn't care much. We should listen to the patient. He will tell us. Instability cannot be measured in degrees of misalignment. Of course, there are cases that uh, they have an obvious scaphoid dissociation and they have obvious increase of a scaphoid angle, but on theory, based on this, instability cannot be measured. It's something, it's a symptom, it's something the patient tells you. Static X-rays cannot show misalignment or it cannot show instability. They can show that there is a gap, of course. In this case, what do you think? Is it unstable? Is it stiff? It can be stiff and or stable or unstable, but they cannot be both. If you have instability, you cannot be stiff. If there is a stiffness, you cannot be unstable. There's a stiffness here. For the same reason, arthroscopy cannot show you instability, cannot assess stability because there is structure. And if this is abnormal physiologic load through it, there is no way of uh, studying this arthroscopically. So, instability, ability to bear all, that's it. Abnormal mobility, it's a different thing, it's a different uh, ball game. Actually, it's abnormal mobility. And abnormal mobility can be in different ways. It can be described at this kinematic wrist. And uh, it can be this kinematic wrist because there are changes in the way the, the wrist moves and there are sudden jumps of uh, one bone from one position to another. This is normal swing. There's a reduced uh, swing. This would be stiffness, pathological or not. It may, uh, you may have an increased uh, wrist laxity and you may have a hypermobility and you may have also normal planes of rotation and still it may be normal. It may be normal and uh, it doesn't have any, any meaning with uh, stability again. It may be predictable dysfunctional rest because of that. But it's predictable. Every time that happens that, it happens. Okay. Or it may have, you have an unpredictable abnormality in the way the wrist is moved. And that's a factor that it's independent on whether the wrist is stable or not. Get it? So, if you are talking about these kinematics, you need a dynamic way of exploring it to assess it. You cannot assess that with the static views because we are talking about the dynamic thing. Misalignment, misalignment, that's a problem. A problem because there are many, many bridges that are normal and yet they are misaligned and there is misalignment. People understand that as, a, as an unstable fit situation. They all think if there is misalignment, you need to treat that. That's a wrong, completely wrong. Okay, this is a, a like some, his phone, uh, yeah. he's about to rupture, he's skipping a ligament. What happened next? Of course, uh, the proximal row, particularly the lunate, was solidly attached to the radius while the scaphoid was pulled by the distal row towards the extension. The scaphoid lunate joined to us distressed, but under a serious torque, and the torque started rupturing the polar scaphoid ligament first, and then you have the old tearing of the proximal to uh, proximal membrane from borrow to dorsal until the dorsal ligament went <coughs> And there he is, he's suffering, he's got pain, but it was only seven seconds before finishing the final, the seventh uh, game final of the uh, NBA. And he had three uh, free falls uh, to win the thing. And he had something wrong in his wrist. He didn't know that it was a complete skillful dissociation, but there was something wrong. And that guy, usually there's a, one of those stupid guys over there, and he said, oh, come on, and then she cannot complain. I mean, this is nothing. Uh, are you a professional, aren't you? I said, well, yes, uh, I'm professional, but uh, oh, it hurts like that. No, actually, he didn't say that. He kept playing. Because he earned so much money for that. <laughs> Well, if it was your man, uh, you would be concerned what would happen if you didn't uh, advise that idiot people over there and, and you stop playing. Um, 
if you keep playing, probably the bridge will stay stable, still stable. Because it's a complete rupture of one limb, and doesn't mean that that wrist is unstable. Okay, we have that the wrist, complete rupture, stable. That's possible. But, of course, if you keep playing, then the surrounding capsule will ca uh, start stretching. Ligaments will start stretching, secondary ligaments will start pulling up, stretching them until they break. And if they break, then there is a massive collapse. It's a moment of maximal instability. There's a lot of instability now. It's a building that it's crumbling, it's collapsing. Okay. Now it's collapsed, everything is collapsed. And you have all the little, little places, little empty uh, spaces will be filled with fibers. This joint degeneration jaw will no longer be unstable with time. With time, you are going to be. A stiffness. And something I've learned is that the stiffness has nothing to do with the instability. You cannot treat the stiff wrist as if it wasn't stable. So this, um, this is, uh, I would say, the concluding remark today. Uh, if you have a, a stable wrist with one ligament rupture, that's fine, but uh, sooner or later will it evolve into an unstable situation? There will be maximum instability there, the red thing, marks the collapse, and the collapse is a maximum instability. And once collapse, it's like the, the cards that are on the floor, this is stable again, and becomes stiff. And therefore, the small alignment, normal alignment, so alignment and normal alignment has nothing to do with the stability. We have normal alignment, and stable. We have normal stable situations, we have normal mal alignment, that are unstable as well, and we have a lot, lots of wrists with complete malalignment that are stiff and not unstable. In the end, clinical symptoms. I will not extend on that because you all are familiar with this. There are many patients with arthrosis that they have clinical symptoms, or they are not. In fact, this keep this in mind. Twenty-eight percent of all the dissections we do in the lab have complete scaphoid dissociation. Of course, they are aging people, of course, but uh, they have that without saying about it. And that means that probably they didn't have any pain. They had a lot of dissociation, but no pain. That means that nature knows how to balance that situation. And if nature knows how to balance that situation, why not? Shouldn't we learn how to do it? And do it. <coughs> so it's been 30 years, so a little bit more, trying to und interpret things, trying to understand what's going on in the instability business. And as uh, this guy, you know, 30 years again, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. <laughs> and I'm serious on that, and that's why I regret to have written this paper. Because that paper was a written in in a position that I didn't know what was talking about. So if you don't understand that, that's fine. I didn't either. <laughs> Thank you very much. So as many of you may know, uh, I've been working on this for not quite as long as Mark, but certainly for many, many decades now, or nearly two decades, I'm trying to develop uh, some sort of animated or some three-dimensional understanding of wrist mechanics. And the, this is actually all my wrist through its various uh, presentation evolutions from uh, 98 up to this is 2001, um, and I think the real problem we have is that uh, why is couple <coughs> research so difficult? Um, uh, there are many theories on carpal mechanics, um, and I think that one of the big issues is that a lot of the carpal mechanic research is actually empirical or observational, basically model me measurements, lots of cadaver work, measuring angles and alignment, and there really aren't often very many patterns, they're all variable. And I think the big difficulty about carpal mechanics is, is if we can talk about carpal mechanics as broadest terms, we need to find some sort of overarching theory or some understanding of what actually drives and makes the wrist workable as it does. And if we can have a theory, it needs to be validated, it needs to be rejected, it can be rejected, but it can never be proven, which is an important part of the theory. But importantly, we need to be, it needs to be uh, testable and, and predictive, so we can actually predict how the bones might, might move. The big problem, and I think Mark would probably agree, that most of the research now is actually uh, in the wrist mechanics is empirical, basically lots of measurements and trying to find patterns. 
And so to find, uh, if, for empirical research to work, you need to find a very consistent pattern, be it gravity, be it light, or whatever. Um, but Monotomo said it quite nicely, saying that um, a single functional model of the risk cannot be identified. And even Trey Crisco, who's done a huge amount of work on carbon mechanics in 3D, said we just can't find the average risk. And it's, I guess it's like trying to find a standard face. I mean, we want what faces look like, but they're all different, just very slightly, very subtly, um, but they're still faces. And the same with the risk, very subtle differences, which means we can't just have a single measurement. So there is no standard risk. And simple, link simple linkages we can't, um, we can't define, uh, or consistent angles. And a lot of the current theories are either both incomplete and they're not predictive and not testable. So they're actually not very good theories. I guess the approach we've used over the years now is to try and find a more conceptual um, research. We basically form a concept of how the risk might work in, in sort of broader terms and then apply various tests and the proposed hypotheses, measure test, and then either enhance, reject, or get very frustrated or try and build a more and more complex, uh, but, but also quite usable and workable theory on how the carbons might work. And so uh, this is where we are at the moment um, in this conceptual approach. Um, I think the uh, risk basically has two degrees of freedom, pitch and yaw. I guess, I know Mark, this has been a very contentious issue, should we say, but let's just go with that. Um, so pitch and yaw. Uh, I think that the critical thing about the risk is to be functional in its, in its um, it needs a stable central column. And, and we've developed this concept of rules-based motion, which allows a whole variation of, um, of components of the risk to still form together to form the standard risk. Now, if you look at this two degrees of freedom, uh, there are about six degrees of freedom, uh, which up and down, side to side, forward and back, uh, pitch and yaw, and also rotation. And I think in reality, the wrist, I think, has basically two degrees of freedom. It's basically flexion extension and, and radiant on deviation, so two degrees of freedom. And I think that while Mark talks about the uh, pronation as, and supination as being an important inherent part of wrist function, wrist motion, I think that the major function of the wrist ligaments is to, to prevent this rotation. Uh, I like your arsehole is a better than the hustle, no, the arsehole ligaments, yeah. Um, but, uh, but I think the reality is that the, and this, this starts to provide some, a more uh, understandable reason why the wrist is, a, is the wrist. <coughs> and it's this central carpal column. Uh, I lost my picture there, anyway. So, um, and, and, but what we have is, this, the, the, is the, the, the lunate to the, to the capitate to the second and third metacarpals is really the central carpal column and the bones on the other side maintain that longitudinal stability. Now, um, as part of this process, I think we've looked at the three-dimensional uh, animation as being an important part of trying to understand what's going on. We've used this software, we've been using it for some years now, we've taken, 3D, we've taken CT scans, make models in positions in flexion extension, radial on deviation. We create the, uh, we animate the models, and then we try and work out the, the inter-bone inter relationships. Are there, are there actually connections between various bones? And we did in fact find over many years there is a connection between on the volar side, a quite consistent um, isometric point between this point here, lunar tropical, lunar radial lunate, and also these trapezium scaphoid, and dorsally on the scaphoid lunate. So very, de very definite isometric connections between components of the wrist. Again, a, a point of contention with Mark. Um, but I think we can actually demonstrate this quite nicely. And in these, these lines here, these different lines represent different lengths and variations as the wrist moves. Um, and the green ones remain isometric and the blue ones don't. And bear in mind, this is actually a three-dimensional relationship. So although this two-dimensional presentation may not appear that they're looking to, to change in, in length, this is in, in 3D in and out of plane. And what we found is that uh, there are definitely certain ligaments that remain isometric and certain ones that don't. And so and you've only got to change the position of the, of the point only very slightly by a millimetre or two, and then isometricity is lost. And so what we've worked on is, is the base of the wrist and telling us where the isometric points are, not the anatomists. And I think in particular, the, uh, the long radial lunate ligament, this is a, could you just animate that next? <coughs> Can you give it a click? Um, if we see here, this is the long radial lunate ligament, um, and the yellow lines represent the isometric connection between the lunate and the radius, and as you move it, just keep it moving it, we can see as it moves backwards and forwards, it, the bones do move, and there are definitely lines that remain isometric, which I think is critically important to the stability of the wrist. And this is the central column we're talking about here, and you know, we've published this some years ago. So I'll, I'll introduce right at the start now that we have um, this idea of these two rows, uh, the proximal row and the distal row, but with this set stable central column. And uh, maybe the, we do have these two rows that are clearly quite, quite, uh, quite definitely linked. 
and maybe each row, and I mentioned this, I'll, I'll build this as we go, but I'll remember to write at the start. I think what's happening is that each of these two rows, be it the distal row and the proximal row, moves only through a single arc of motion. It's a simple, let's just think of flex and extends and that's all. And by having these two arcs, of these two rows moving through a single arc of motion, but being offset, and having a different combination with your inflection, extension, or both inflection, gives us this two degrees of freedom. And so we have this, uh, the coronal proximal row, the offset coronal uh, distal row, pushed out by the trapeze, by the trapezoid, which pushes this trapezium forward and therefore rotates the distal row. Uh, this gives us this, uh, this motion. So, uh, stable simple column, and the rules-based motion, um, to bring this all together, this was part of a larger, larger theory uh, based on Telesnik's work. And what we're talking about is having um, um, these four rules, bone morphology, the constraints, interaction between the bones and the applied loads. By having these variations in these different components of the wrist, we build the wrist. As the rules vary, we still have the same um, end result. And, if we look, and so what we have is the bone morphology, the isolated <coughs> constraints, the surface interaction, and the load, which together, as a sort of like a, like a product, provide wrist motion. So you can change the shape slightly, the linkages need to change. So it gives us this capacity to have this great variation in wrist measurements, but still the same outcome as a, as a workable wrist. And so what we've done is um, tried to identify the, uh, the models, the, the, the bones, the linkages, and we want to do this in the computer, but it's been quite difficult, and I'll show you some of these stuff later on. We apply the loads, and then we, we apply motion and see if it works. And if we just run that, if we would, what we've got, and this is our model here, so these are, these are basically five bones, quite stable, but they move. So what we have here is a very stable construct through certain, certain marks of motion, and it's just these, these simple, they're actually seven little seven lines, this, this, these, these simulate the tendons, and this simulates the, uh, the ligaments. So the bone shape, very clear, critically designed, plus the specific ligament connections, creates a, a stable construct. Now, one of the other issues we have is, uh, do, is the, um, if we found these isometric points on radial and on deviation, um, are they in flexion and fle flexion extension as well? And so what about flexion extension? Do these isometric lines or connections um, occur with the risk going in the opposite direction, not just radial and on deviation? And so again, as part of the theory of testing, we have a hypothesis that the isometric constraints are present in all directions. So that's our, uh, so the testing it is to do isometric analysis of a scapulonate connection or radial lunate connection in wrist flexion extension. Now this is the same wrist, this is in, this is in flexion, all right? Um, in extension here and, and flexion, so flexion and extension, same wrist. And what we basically do is you, we get the, uh, we, we identify points on the radius, we then identify points on the lunate, and we, we measure between each of those points on the lunate and each of those points on the radius in, fl in flexion and extension. And what we find is there's actually only one line, one pair of dots which actually lines up and remains isometric through range and it happened to correspond to the long radial ligament. So we've found that on flexion extension, there is in fact a definite, uh, almost a singular point of, of isometricity between the two bones. So our hypothesis is actually uh, correct, that uh, it was, was validated that there is actually um, scattered lunate connection, uh, isometricity in flexion extension and radial and non deviation. And so we have this, uh, this combination that uh, if the rows, how the rows then move, and if they in fact have isometric constraints in both directions, it must be that they're only moving in one single arc of the rotation. They can't be like a universal joint. <coughs> so we have the articular surface and its coronal, coronal angle with the, uh, the, the proximal row sitting, whoops, sitting like this. And on top of this is the distal row at a different angle. And again, I mentioned pushed around by the trapezoid as it pushes the trapezium forward and rotates the, the axis of rotation of the, dis of the distal row. And this corresponds to the dart throwing motion where the proximal row is stable and the, and the mid couple joint simply moves through this oblique, um, oblique coronal arc. And so the hypothesis therefore is that do in fact the two rows move in the same direction in pitch and yaw and uh, in the two degrees of freedom. And the hypothesis is that the uh, proximal row moves simply in a coronal arc like this and the distal row moves in this arc, simply flexion extension, that's all. So what we did is we got the okay, three dimensional models and we have, this is a wrist flexion and this is a wrist extension, again, different amounts of, uh, of motion, but in fact the same direction. We've hit, we're high the distal row and what we find, that when the wrist goes in the wrist flexion, the, uh, the proximal row flexes, and when the wrist goes in the wrist rate of deviation, the proximal row flexes. So the proximal row moves in the same direction in the two, the two degrees of freedom. 
So, wrist flexion and radial deviation it flexes, wrist extension and ulnar deviation it extends. Same arc, different range. D the distal row, well, the distal row does the same thing. It simply removes the same arc of motion on the proximal row. So what we have is in wrist flexion, the distal, the distal row flexes, in ulnar deviation, the distal row flexes. And correspondingly, in wrist extension or radial deviation, so basically you have the proximal row, the distal row, and they basically uh, will move in a single arc, but because the proximal row flexes, it changes the starting point of the distal row. So it's actually starting in a whole different position, which allows it to create this offset range of motion. And if just trying to, trying to demonstrate this a little better, if you just, if you just uh, hit the one on the, right, on the left. We, this is simplified, and these are, these are actually now playing sequentially. This is not how to do, but flexes and flexes. Proximal row flexes, distal row flexes. You turn it inside here. Flex, flexes and flexes. Hit the other one, thanks. Extends and extends. Extends and extends. Next slide. If we look at uh, rate of deviation, however, just hit the left one, Sam. We, we find the proximal flexes, distal row extends. And notice how the motion of the triquetrum moves, so yeah, to, to change the offset slightly. So flexes and extends. That time? No. Yeah. I'm getting close there. I'm going to jump on my watch in a second. It's Fair enough. Okay. Um, and just hit the other one, the ulnar deviation one. We find the ulnar deviation proximal extends, distal row flexes. And note the motion of the triquetrum as it moves to change the offset of, the, of this arc. So basically what we have now is these two rows of motion, which are actually moving uh, through a single arc, but because of the offset nature, it gives us a two degrees of freedom. And we can see this sort of, perhaps more simply in this little uh, wooden, wooden model here, which, um, so here's the proximal row, the distal row, we can see that this is the scaphoid, tra trapezium, it's fixed this, at this side. On the ulnar side, the triquetrum moves backwards and forward and it gives us this offset arc, arc motion of the distal row. So that means as we um, go into extension, extends and extends, flexes, flexes the inflection, and again, similarly, in rate of deviation, uh, flexes, extends, extends, flexes. So the simple two uh, and uniaxial motion of the two rows, which are offset and have a variable offset, and you can look at this model later on if you wish, gives us the two degrees of freedom in a very stable and predictable way. And I think this is work, this is work that's uh, been shown by Monotoma as well in saying that the, um, this is not this is new, the distal row motion is uniaxial, so it's a single arc of motion with the scaphoid, it's stuck to the scaphoid, and by simply moving the triquetrum slightly, it changes the actual arc of motion. So the, the distal row is sitting on the scaphoid, moving in a single arc, but by changing the position of the triquetrum and moving its, its offsetness, that's the right word, it changes the actual uh, final, final motion. So the, the proximal row does in fact control the position of the distal row. And so we have this, this combined binary output of the two offset unitary arc, of, arc joints. <laughs> Imagine opening this slide first. <laughs> Um, so the combined binary output of the two offset unitary arc joints gives us the two degrees of freedom. So these two rows are linked together, and this gives us the, um, the, the stable wrist that, that, that provides the stable central column to provide the sort of function that we need. And so we have, so this makes sense of the variable and complicated nature of the wrist, we use the stable central column, the rule space motion, and the two gear, two gear four bar linkage, which I haven't touched on. Uh, it makes sense because you can have a different, side, different shape scape with a different shape radius and a different position of the, the tendons, but because they all sort of math, mix and match together, you have the same binary, it's the same product output. It brings together all the model observations and various measurements. It explains stability and instability, although, <laughs> good luck with that. And it also explains the, uh, the dart throwing motion too, and shows how, the, how the, the, the distal row really does have a very important role in terms of oblique power grip. And what's I think is important is predictive and for unusual patterns of injury and provides a basis for further research. And uh, as I said, I think the proximal row controls the mid-carpal mid alignment and motion and it's quite critical. And this has led on to uh, this little reconstruction which we've been working with recently, which I'll present later on. Thank you. So uh, let's go. So we'll see a slightly different view. Uh, yeah. all, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the uh, hats off to both of you there. Um, so with regard to the, uh, the wrist, we know that the distal radius and the shape of it, it's probably surprising that we don't see a lot more carpal instabilities or all sorts of issues that we do in clinical practice. We know that the, the columns are important for loading, we know that the rows I think are important for the mobility, but I think there's the other concept which I think of as the rings, which provide stability and hold the whole construct together. So with regard to the columns, 
we can see here the loading is important and we can see it's important to create compression across the carpus and transmit the load from the radius uh, into, the, into the hand. We can see with this micro CT of the lunate, we can see the internal structure of the bone is important and designed to be a column in itself. With regard to the radius, we also know that the structure of the radius is also designed to transmit load from the radius uh, to the subcondyl bone plate into the shaft. If we look at the, uh, the carpus, we can see here in a neutral position how the load tends to go uh, through the radial column and the central column, but as we transmit the load, we transmit the wrist into radial deviation, the load of the carpus is now changed, the columns are reorientating, so the load is now through to the radial side of the wrist, and with ulnar deviation, again, we can see that the loading is different. We can see the scapegoat is not even loading on the radius. So the columns change alignment and change the loading depend upon the position of the wrist, and the proximal carpal row tends to swivel in and around underneath the distal carpal row, which is often considered as a monoblock. So with regard to how do the columns fail, we know in a Barton's fracture or a translunate type fracture that there's often a, a, an instability, instability, a fracture of the, the osseous structure which leads to the failure of that entire column. Distal carpal row, is it a monoblock? I think it's probably a little bit of a simplification to say it's a monoblock, but in essence that it does have, a, have motion through within the distal carpal row. We can see here between the uh, trapezium and trapezoid, we can see there's some independent motion, so if you're loading up to pinch, the transmission of the load through the scaphoid, whereas if you're power gripping, you're going through more of the central column. And if we look at this arthroscopy, we can see the capitate and the hamate does have independent motion at that level, and this is important for transmitting the load between the carpal rows. Now Mark taught us this uh, back in 1989, Mark, I think you had longer hair back then, but what Mark taught us was about the different types of axial instabilities. But I think one of the additions and adding on to that is that all of these have a distal carpal row involvement. So the axial instabilities are a distal carpal row instability. Going to the proximal carpal row, which is the thing that we all tend to talk about, and someone told me recently that all instabilities involve the proximal carpal row. I don't think that's actually true. But if we have a look at how the rows interact, we know that with the uh, wrist going into flexion and extension, so as the uh, wrist goes into radial deviation, sorry, you get this obligatory flexion of the scaphoid, and if you go into ulnar deviation, you get obligatory extension of the triquetrum. If you have scaphoid instability, it breaks. I'm just going to show that again because... So if you go into radial deviation, you get obligatory flexion of the scaphoid, and in ulnar deviation, obligatory extension of the triquetrum, and the scaphoid sits in, and lunate sits in the middle in this balanced position. With scaphoid lunate instability, we now have an unbalanced carpus. Um, David Lickman taught us many years ago about this uh, oval ring concept, and this is really about the transmission of load and uh, interaction forces between all those rings, uh, bones of the ring, and we can see how the proximal and distal carpal row are aligned in this way. So if we go into radial deviation, we can see the scaphoid goes into flexion because of the obliquity of the, of the trapezium. So distal scaphoid and scaphoid fracture goes into flexion, and in lunar triquetral instability, we can see that the lunar and the scaphoid go into flexion. So the thing that we're starting to work on now, and some of that talk has been, many of you would have seen before, but we're trying to reassess how we approach the carpal attachments Steve Vegas' work on the top left, some work that we've done uh, with Quinton Fogg and Matthias Umstein, and then also looking at our CT scans. And we can see on this uh, CT scan clearly the attachment points of the ligaments. And we can identify these as nidus points, which is a term defined by Tubiana. And so if we look at these ligament attachment points or nidus points, there's a number of these to find over the carpus, and some of these relate to the areas that Michael's identified on his computer tomography. And if we look at the attachment points and we join where the ligaments clearly are, we can see that there are these anatomical rings that provide stability for the carpus. Mark has uh, taken a slightly different approach on this and talks about pronation rings and supination rings. And in fact, if you draw them out on here, you actually get Mark's rings. So you can also apply this on the volar side, and in the interest of time, I won't go through that. But if we go then looking at the flexor retinaculum and how the flexor retinaculum works all together, 
and I never sort of really appreciated this, but the, there's an attachment at the proximal row and the distal carpal row for the flexor retinaculum. And as you can see, as the wrist would go from radial to ulnar deviation, that basically those points on the radial and ulnar aspect would tend to be stabilised and the ligaments, the um, flexor tendons are able to go through that tunnel. And then it's interesting to see how on the volar aspect, how the tendons also provide stability at the corners of the uh, flexor retinaculum. So Mark mentioned 4D CT scan, and we've done a fair bit of work on that uh, more recently, uh, identifying the 4D CT scan and trying to get a better understanding of how this works. And if we go into radial deviation using these tendons that we know, and we know that the trapezium pushes the scaphoid into flexion, and we can see the centre of rotation. So we then tend to get this translation of the entire proximal carpal row in an ulnar direction as we go into more radial deviation. Then the volar carpal ligaments become taut, which is what Michael was talking about. And we can see that in this position they become taut, and then we stop having ulnar translocation. There's no more ulnar translocation. So we have a redirection of the forces because of the restraint. So it's a sequential, stable, uh, sequential restraining of different aspects of the carpus. And then the scaphoid starts to flex. It's flexing over the, uh, the radius scaphoid capitate ligament. It then can't flex anymore, it starts to rotate, and then it can't rotate anymore, and now the wrist has gone to the end of the range of motion. So we have a sequential mobilisation of different aspects of the carpus where sequentially the restraints kick into order uh, to, to restrict the range of motion. And if you have a type 1 lunate or a type 2 lunate, these changes the, the orientations and how those different aspects work. So with regard to the rings, just coming back to that aspect, we can see that these provide stability of the carpus, and the rings we know are important in anatomy. With regard to the pelvis, we know that's an important stabilising structure. But there's also rings between the rows, and Kuhlman's ring and the STT joint. So this is between the radius and the triquetrum, and we can see that this ring prevents a translation of the carpus, and it allows that whole triquetrum to swivel, which I think fits in a little bit with what Michael was saying. So failure of this ring leads to ulnar translocation. The STT joint, we uh, can see that the, uh, it really has almost like it's a flexion extension joint and we can see how the, on the volar aspect, in fact it's similar to the volar plate that we're familiar with in the hand. There are also rings between the forearm and the proximal carpal row and the distal carpal row and we can see that important type of instability that we know is a real problem in clinical practice where there's an avulsion of those volar carpal ligaments and of course, uh, distraction is important uh, with regard to the orientation of these ligaments. So if we look at this, uh, it's almost like the core position of the wrist. Uh, we know the ulna is the primary bone of the forearm, and we can see that we have these uh, ligaments that span from the distal ulna to the radius and then onto the carpus. So the ulna carpal ligaments are strategically positioned for stability. And if we have a disruption of those, we not only have instability of the distal radial ulna joint, but we get an ulna carpal sag. So why do we have columns? Well, columns are all about uh, providing loading across the carpus. And why do we have rows? Well, the rows are important to function. It allows us to, uh, to be able to create a gearing mechanism. It enables the whole proximal carpal row to swivel underneath the distal carpal row to enable the various ranges of motion and it allows us to reorientate the columns so that load is transmitted in different ways. And so why the rings? Well, the rings are all about stability, of course, and clearly these are some of the, the problems that we're facing in clinical practice, and the challenge is now to put them back together. But with these concepts, I think we can fit together all of the named instabilities and hopefully fit together and get a better understanding of the carpus. So the rows, columns and rings, the columns change orientation through motion. It allows load sharing between the, uh, the columns. It allows strength in any wrist position, and it creates a multi-angular uh, joint. So we've uh, also been doing some work with the hexapod, which is a, is a, is a robot where we're able to mobilise the wrist. We have published a couple of papers on, on this and we're trying to put that into our models as well. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge our university for that, where they're able to get real-time orientation of different positions of the carpus and the loading. So finally, can you advance that slide? I think we're almost finished. Can that slide go forward, please?
Um, I think, I'm in, Mr Chairman, I might finish on that note. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Jeff uh, for the hospitality and uh, Rowan and for the wonderful session. Thank you very much. Thank you. 43 years, 1,500 peer-reviewed articles, all about scaphalinic instability. We did a systematic review of the literature, largely done by Diana Baker, but also with Chantel Sorgiovanni and Melita Ryan, and I think they're all here. We looked at the history, examination, imaging, treatment, outcomes, and we restricted our assessment or our evaluation to 49 articles where we thought we could get some meaningful information. There is no single reliable sign of instability. X-ray, CT, MRI, static, dissociation, separation, malalignment, that's easy. But dynamic false negatives can miss. What about arthroscopy? This is a wrist with normal x-rays MRI. And watch this. Dynamic scaphoid separation. The scaphoid on the right, the lunate on the left. And I emphasize this is a person with clinical symptoms, because this could be normal too, but symptomatic. Classifications, well, we just heard probably three of the most erudite and learned people talk about scaphalinate instability. I find it confusing, and I think so do they. <coughs> it's difficult. The natural history. I don't know where these figures come from, but it said that 5 to 10 percent, well, I've read the article, with scaphalinate instability will get slack arthritis. So do we have to operate on all of them to prevent the inevitable slack arthritis? The data's not there. 30% of elderly cadavers will have scaphalinate instability. And I don't think they were complaining about the problem when they died. At least the ways nobody was listening. It's not just about the scaphalinate ligament. It is linked with the extrinsic ligaments. These are diagrams from Liz Hagen. The ligaments behave differently under load, hysteresis. The anatomy is variable. We've heard about the wrist being like a face. It is. The mid-carpal joint varies, the triscapoid joint varies, the, the quality of ligaments vary. So each wrist is unique, and each wrist will express its problems in different ways. And so will the people at the end of the wrist. The wrist you can do very, very well. And people vary in their ability to do that as well. So I was perplexed. And when I was perplexed, what do you do? You look back in your own, in your own results. And they weren't very pleasant. Quite rude, actually. 10 years, and you can see I can't make up my mind. I tried the modified Mark Garcia Arnius operation, the 3LT. I tried the Ross. I tried the McToolin. I tried the PC Ho, which is an <coughs> extra capsular anterior posterior arthroscopic open repair. And then I figured I couldn't hold it together, so I added tape. Now, these aren't really scientific things because my appreciation of this problem changed over the time. And, and the, it was just an overall impression about how good was I doing. So this is what we got. A mean of 86 degrees in the flexion extension arc. What can I expect from a tendon weave? Because this is what it is. It's just a piece of tendon wound around the wrist to hold it together so it doesn't go and you're going to hope it's going to work. Well, my figures, besides the motion arc of 86 degrees, we had a dash of 30 to 40, and we had a JMAR of 72%. And 20% of mine went on to a partial fusion. So I think Mark said that, we can't harm people. Changing perception. We're now looking not just at dash range of motion and a JMAR, but we're looking at pronation strength, supination strength, and force play strength. And we're finding a lot of interesting data that we don't quite know what to do with yet. But hopefully it will help us in the future make some sense about what to do for people with these problems. They're starting to see things differently. Talking about dynamic, 
instability, there is a drive inside and a drive through side. I emphasize these are symptomatic risks with nothing else wrong. In traction and out of traction, because it's a little bit simplistic, we're looking at these risks with a 1.9 millimeter dynamic, uh, diameter arthroscope, which you can snap in your fingers if you try hard enough. And you, you can't equate that to somebody leaning, leaning on a table or a surface and placing their weight, their whole body weight on it. It's, it's a very narrow view of what's going on. So if you test them in traction, you'll miss a lot. You have to examine them arthroscopically in and out of traction. Here it is in traction, and you can see it opens, the scapegoat will let it open. But if you take the traction off, it, you can drive in, but it's not a drive through. The scapegoat and the linear are open, but you cannot drive through it. Did you? Oh, yeah. Good. So this is a drive through sign. Scapegoat in the left, linear in the right, capitate in the top, and a fracture of the inferior pole of the linear. So you can drive back and through the scapegoat from the radio carpal joint to the mid carpal joint. So we had a look at scapholunar instability, people that turned up over 12 months with what I would call painful mechanical symptoms in their wrist. And we found that 90 were dynamic. 87 had a drive-in sign, so you could drive from the mid-carpal joint in between the scapholunar joint easily, and you hit the scapholunar ligament complex and you couldn't get to the radiocarpal joint. And three had a drive-through sign where you could go backwards and forwards. 17 were static. <coughs> now the drive-in signs and the drive-through signs, arthroscopic was 100% in terms of working out what was going on. X-rays, 3%. MRIs, 9%. And 10% were uncertain. So what happened to these 87 drive-in signs? Because if you look at some of the classifications, they would tell you to operate on them. I said, operate on them. Well, when you sat down and talked to them about what the results were with surgery and what we know about it and what happened, 13 didn't want anything. They just ran away. 31 actively got involved with our therapy program. Nine had surgery, they're quite symptomatic. And 35 had other pathology. So, Four of our therapy patients went on to surgery. We couldn't control their symptoms with therapy for more than three months. And three of my surgery patients went on to partial fusion. So what happened to the ones that had other pathology? TFC repair, distal radius osteotomy, ulnar shortening osteotomy, shorted their problems out. So the importance of a full and accurate diagnosis, and Mark's going to talk to us about that later, about looking at everything, not just focusing on the scapholunar instability, maybe a red herring. Of the 27 that had therapy, 92%, well, of the 20, they could, they could have 92% power in the contralateral side. So they were nearly normal in terms of the JMI. But we're now starting to look at other factors, as I mentioned before, force plate, supination, and pronation strength. So 15% had no treatment, they just had edu education. 31% had therapy. So 46% of these symptomatic risks did not have surgery. 40% had surgery for other pathologies, so they didn't have surgery for their scapholunar instability, the importance of a complete diagnosis. And 10% had a ligament repair or soft tissue repair. 3% had a partial fusion. So out of all of them, 30% had surgery to deal with the instability. The rest didn't have surgery. So this is an arthroscopic dorsal capsule, the desis, the batons, popularized, tailings <coughs> modified, and we're using a double strand to a vital another modification. And the question now, is that any better than leaving them alone? So we have the data for leaving them alone. It may be this operation is so good because it's not doing any damage. We don't know. But we've got the measurements and we're soon going to find out. This is a version of Mark's operation, probably not done as well as Mark. You can see I've put anchors into it because I'm struggling. I'm trying to make it work better for me. 
This is Mark Ross version. Look at that come together. You know, that feels so, so good when you pull it and it comes together, but nothing wrecks it more than follow up in my hands. <laughs> like, this is the one that PCO does. It's an extra capsule or entry to post your arthroscopic open. That's when I first started, so I got a cut so you can see what's going on. The benefit of that is you don't do a capsulotomy, you don't denovate the capsule, so hopefully if you need to do something later on, you've got something to work with. You've got nerves and you can react with the brain. So um, what happens here? Rotatory scapholinate laxity without separation, scapholinate separation without a drive-in sign. You've got dynamic with a drive-in sign, dynamic with a drive-through sign. You've got static with malalignment, static with subluxation, and that can be dynamic or static. That's a tricky one, I find. And slack arthritis. Well, the laxity bit you can throw out. That's normal, okay? And it uh, doesn't need an operation. For these guys, a lot of the previous classifications will say off-rate. What we found is if you give them therapy, time, proprioception, 80% will be fine. 20% will not, and they'll go to surgery. Of the ones that have surgery, 80% will be okay, and 20% will go to a fusion. So it's a pretty serious thing when you start operating on people with this. Drive-through sign, well, we don't have enough of them. In a year, we only had three. One had surgery, one ran away, and one's thinking about it. You talk to them quite clearly, that's what they want, okay? That's a really a symptomatic risk for drive-through. Malalignment, subluxation with the proximal poles off the dorsal lip. You know, I've always thought in the past that needed a tendon weak, but it needs to be flavoured with something. So what do you do? What do I do? No pain, no treatment. Done. Doesn't matter what the x-ray looks like. Pain and disability, we look at their functional assessment and work out whether they're going to have therapy or go to some form of soft tissue reconstruction. So, I don't like classifications. This is my current roadmap, what I use, and it'll probably be different next year. It's probably different now after hearing these first three talks. Symptoms and function. These classifications are nothing without measuring what people can do. Nothing, therapy, surgery. They're here. If we can't solve it with, with, with therapy, they get a modified methylum. Malalignment, a tendon weave, there's all sorts of mild use of PC Ho. But what I would emphasize is in the last year I've done two. And of all the people, I said, all I do is hand and wrist. I've only done two tendon weaves in the last year after looking at this. And there were people with acute injuries within three to six weeks. They were howling with pain and they were really sore. And the emotion of that kind of presentation with a big gap, that's the thing that forced me into that. But it's rare. And of course, arthroscopic partial fusion if they need it. 80% therapy and exercises. Huh? So when I, when, I, when I was talking to the therapists on Friday night and they knew Mark was coming, they were so excited because they want to hear what Mark's got to say about rehabilitating these risks. So laxity and instability, therapy and surgery. This is Pierre Paolo Borelli. And um, a, a little bit of a diversion. I didn't know what to do with scapholinate instability. So I asked one of the foremost surgeons in the world that came with a gentleman in the front to give a talk for 10 minutes. I gave him another three minutes. I wanted to hear what he thought about scapholinate instability. He had three months and he said I was crazy, he would need a year, he wasn't going to do it. So I asked another colleague, and we'll, that, we'll leave that one alone, Greg. <laughs> and my reward for that question was I, get, I got to talk about that in seven minutes in uh, Budapest a year ago, and I tortured my therapist, I, the therapist I worked with for a year to try and get together, what does this clinical thing mean? So in addition to that, I got asked to comment on a case, and I got the stuff two days beforehand, and it had the JMAS and the range of motion and the spider graphs, and it was a surgeon who was about 42, who was an orthopedic surgeon, he was a hip knee surgeon, so he's a manual worker. And um, he had a great gap between his scaphoid and his lunate. It was about, oh, I think six months, something like that, three to six months. 
And he asked me what I would do. And I looked at his parameters. He had a better range of motion than my weaves. He had a better j strength than what I was getting with my weaves. And I said that I would do nothing. And the furor, the absolute furor, it was embarrassing. Everybody said, oh, you've got to operate, you've got to operate. So I'm sitting there in front of the whole audience, cringing like that, wanting to do the walk of shame by yourself. You screwed up. Terrible. So then the chairman said, hey, Pierre Paola. Now, Pierre Paola's full of energy. His idea of a good time is walking across a desert without any water and hoping he survives at the end of it. <laughs> He's a very active man. He said, Pierre Paola, what's your wrist like? And he got up and he went, it's great. And the chairman said, what does it look like on the x-ray? Worse than that, guys. And he said, I asked six experts for an opinion, and in the end, I decided to live with it. So I, you know, Pierre Piel, I've seen him an email, I'd be very pleased I'm talking about him here. Um, I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Actually, biphomechanics is the base for any treatment for you that are uh, uh, hand therapists, you should know that better than me, and probably you'll be pleased to know that uh, there are not only ligaments, there are also muscles, and we should rely on muscles because those are our allies, not our enemies or our unknowns. Let's start by saying that uh, this is not your <coughs> park, actually, it's much more complicated. There's, uh, uh, it's not a simple joint, actually it's not a joint. Uh, so we have seen today there are so many bones, so many ligaments, so many articulations, and uh, so many things that the people are thinking that there are ligaments actually are not. Most of them are not. And there are many, many tendons crossing that joint. And uh, by the way, you have seen that before also, there are no uh, no such thing as two identical wrists. All of them are unique. All of them are um, have their own features, you know. And the same can be said for carpal injuries. If you look all of those carpal injuries, they were kind of uh, randomly pulled from uh, from a list of uh, injuries that I had in my casual today. So they may look similar, but they are all unique. All injuries should be treated as if they were one single unit. Uh, so, tailor-made treatments, that's the key. Uh, kinetics, um, we have been talking about uh, a lot about kinematics. I don't know how to treat kinematics. I know how to treat kinetics a little bit, but not kinematics. Kinematics is much more difficult than we think, because there's a lot of uh, things involved, as you said. Joint surfaces, uh, ligaments uh, constraining ligaments, ligaments guiding, uh, muscles, uh, torques, uh, not only two degrees of freedom. I'm sorry, but I think that the third degree of freedom is also important, pronation, supination, torques. Um, maybe I should write. <coughs> Evidently, any activity that you create, uh, you're creating axial forces that are transmitted across the wrist, and all those are generating forces inside of the wrist, that uh, create some displacements, and the displacement need to be within one range. They should not go outside of that range, and besides, once the force is released, they should return to the original alignment and the original position when unloaded. That would be the general, the general definition of uh, instability. And what that, uh, when that does not happen, that's instability. Again, instability is a very rare condition in which bones do not return to the original position and uh, bones go far beyond the normal position. And I'm not talking about gaps, I'm talking about the dorsal subluxation of the scaphoid over the rim, the dorsal rim of the radius, that's what matters, not the gap. What does structure ensure stability aside from the muscles? Uh, ligaments are one, another one is muscles, sensory motor system. I like this scheme of thoughts. I mean, ligaments are like the infantry, they are just to hold uh, the war, the, the invasion uh, forces, the muscles are the artillery. And between the two, we need uh, not a direct communication. If there was a direct communication, it's easy to get one. 
um, you need something like a sensory motor system, command post, and then those are the guys that we need to preserve. Those are very, very important because without artillery, the infantry can just uh, remain there several minutes, not more. You need some bombs uh, to attack, to counterattack. So ligaments, besides ligaments, look at that. Those are the descriptions of the ligaments of the wrist of one of the most recent textbooks. I mean, it, it is stupid. I mean, if we had so many ligaments and so, and this way, we couldn't move at all. We couldn't move our wrists. So how could you pronounce it if the ligament and chunk were really right? We couldn't. If these terms were correct, we could not move our wrists. That's for sure. What's a ligament? What is not? Again, another basic, uh, another basic question. It's like the basic question about stability. No, is that a ligament? Is it not? I think that, that there is a good answer uh, by looking at this electron microscopy of a ligament fascicle. A ligament is a dense band of collagen fibers, and it to be all parallel. Those fibers from one bone to another. You need a bone on one side and bone on, on the other side. And um, furthermore, uh, those fibers should not allow more than 8% of the original length being disrupted. If you have something that can be elongated as far as 30%, that shouldn't be a ligament. Actually, it's not. And that's been demonstrated by Bebe, many, many good. Uh, Savio Wu is one of the, of the clever guys who said, OK, if you want to know what a ligament is, uh, set a, a load uh, stress, stress string uh, forward and, and you'll see if that's a ligament. So, is this a ligament? How many of you would say that this is a collateral ligament? <coughs> or a collateral ligament? No, it is not. It is not because the, it, there's a loose connective tissue inside and also because it can elongate more than 30% of the original length. That's not a ligament. That, let's not talk of this as a ligament. So having said that, uh, then about ligaments, what's the force of ligaments? We have been talking about ligaments as if they were cables. We have been always talking about uh, if they were cables, isn't that? Tensegrity was the name. Tensegrity was something that it was invented by Fuller in the, in the, by the end of the last year, uh, the last century, I would say that uh, it says, under load, all bones displace. And the ligaments are there like cables just to hold it in place. And, and they believed that that was the key of all the magics of stability. So that the lunate, you have an axial load that will increase in size as you are displacing the bone. And, and the more uh, the tower of the ligament, the more compressed will be the joint and the more stable. Oh, voila. I would love that things were that simple. I would love it. But it's not that simple. Actually, it's never that simple. Because then there's a crack, and you have that crack, and that means that if there is a crack, there's instability. And if all breasts were behaving this way, all ligament ruptures would be unstable. All of them would come with us with symptoms, and any gap would be really an unstable situation. It would be a problem. On the other side, if that was true, there wouldn't be any, any, any sportment without ligament injuries. Why? Because all ligaments uh, function and we can also create some supination if we use, instead of the pronators, we use the supinators. And the supinators control basically uh, pronation and the other ones are basically anti-pronation ligaments. Like tendons, I mean. So this is the base. This is the base of any treatment. We have a those muscles are like reins of a horse that can uh, prevent or produce supination if there is a, a torque that is in this inflammation and the reverse. So we have an axial loading. Skill foot wants to go into flexion, all those ligaments become taut. The ligaments are about to disrupt. There's the there's the, um, the infantry, and now we have the artillery that have been told to react and to express themselves by producing extension and supination, you know, skillful goes into flexion and pronation, 
skin for goes into extension circulation if you are acting with one muscle. And the muscle needs to be right there, just at the right <coughs> moment. So that the sensory motor system, this is a complex system. I mean, it's not easy. I'm not trying to fool yourself by saying, I know how it works. No, I don't. But I know that that works, and I know it because uh, there have been that have been doing the diagnosis, they are here treating these patients well. Next, uh, uh, next question, uh, how many of those uh, instabilities can you treat? Well, actually very few. In fact, you know all of this, this is that algorithm based on, on six questions, and there are seven stages uh, to say something. I'm sorry, but only the first one can be treated conservatively. Everything can be treated conservatively, I'm not saying that, but this is the right, the right indication, so we should be the first to be there on conservative treatment, partial tears, normal angles, normal articular surfaces. This is where we are effective, not in the other ones. So for each of those, we have all these uh, plethora of uh, our, uh, probable um, solutions. Most of them are useless, most of them are bullshit. And they need to be, well, uh, yeah, mm, some of them are mine, and most of mine are bullshit. And I know. <laughs> the, other ones, the other ones, they don't, but those are, I know they <coughs> Anyway, in this case, stage one, conservative treatment, this is not bullshit. And we know it because there's, as you said, 30% of the patients have no symptoms, and therefore we don't see them. And they're out there just to tell us. What are you doing in this clinic that you're trying to fix something that we fix, that the nature fix it automatically? The good news is that that's a pyramidal situation where those are massive, massive amount of patients. Massive amount of patients that can be treated conservatively. So if we are, if I was a Christopher Columbus, this is one Carabella, the other one it's in the hands of a surgeon's, other one in the hands of somebody else. But the third one is in the hands of hand therapists. Hand therapists, you have a strong, strong play to, a strong, a strong game to play in this. How? Um, well, remember, supinators protect the gap. Pronators open the gap. Through what mechanism? You have seen that. If you apply a pronation, pronation you are uh, torquing the distal roll, the, uh, the torquing the distal roll, the supination, it's uh, pulling the scaphoid away from the, from the, scape, from the lunate, supinators to the reverse. So if you have a scaphoid lunate dissociation or scaphoid lunate instability in the sense that I've said before, work on the supinators and you'll be fine. Is that something that we have learned? No, something that they are demonstrating. And this is one of the first papers that uh, proved that the pragmatic intervention of stage one schifolent instability is powerful. And they can sense and they can find, at least this is a prospective study based on seven patients, seven patients that were pulled out from the waiting list in surgery. They never went back to surgery because they needed. And if you look carefully to this patient, at this paper, and you look all the all the, the the good news is that they are doing well. They are doing. They are going back to that pool of enormous amount of patients that don't are not patients anymore. They are not patients because they don't feel any pain, don't feel any stress, and they can work quite well. Would they be better if they had been operated? I'm not sure. Particularly if they are using bullshit. <coughs> of uh, procedures as the ones I've described sometimes. So in, in a way, in the Birmingham Breast Instability Program, I can provide you with some, some numbers if you want, is effective and it's based on using uh, supinators uh, to provoke that supination that will prevent the scaffold from flexing, just APL, ECRL, and some other more. Again, this is, uh, this is true. I think this is the more scientific slide that I can provide to you to demonstrate that close reduction and uh, muscle radication is enough in many cases just to get a good result in the end. There are thousands of people out there with painless couples to your Fridays. How they do it? 
We don't know, but maybe it would be a good idea for us to learn from nature what the, how is it doing to avoid symptoms to lose the saliva rests. So that's a problem that we cannot explain it simply. It looks like a maneuver of uh, confusion. We are trying to confuse people, and I don't think it's that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, I've seen that uh, I have in the program uh, now presented the, the topic that uh, it's the four leaf clover approach. It's, a, it's an approach that we have been using quite a while from now. And since it has been quite successful in its conception and the practicality of using it, uh, Jeff asked me to present that actually it's not really for the, for the wrist instability thing. It's more in general, something to assess problems with the DRUJ um, joint, which to me should not be called disability ulnar. It should be called <coughs> ready on carbon articulation. Having said that, uh, I want you to report on a, on a case, and a case that I failed the diagnosis, I failed the treatment, it was so embarrassed that that gave me the opportunity of uh, thinking what was uh, needed, and I did it. I think it was a good idea. That's why I'm presenting it. Um, as you can say, I'm not only showing you successful things or successful, uh, successful ideas, I'm showing you my failures as well. And I think that uh, you learn a lot by doing this. So, case presentation, uh, I'm sorry I don't have that uh, movie, that movie, actually, you can imagine. There was somebody who had a complete uh, dissociation between the distal radial joint and the radio ulnar carpal ligaments. Everything was uh, bad, in bad shape, so you could uh, just mobilize that, that radius and the carpus back and forth relative to the ulnar. Even though it looks like a lunate, I, an ulnar instability, actually, it's a radio carpal instability. Um, if you ever have figured out a, a profile of your wrist to know if whether or not this sagittal view is really sagittal, it's really profiled, well profiled, uh, there's one trick, and probably you all know that, uh, you need to figure out the outline of the busy form, and the busy form needs to be exactly at the right uh, distance between the scaphoid and the capitate, in the middle of that. If that outline is exactly there, that means that the, the profile, the, the lateral view is right. And if the lateral view is right, then what is not right is the fact that the ulna stick there, it's the axis, so the radius and the carpus is displaced palmowards. So this is pathological. That was the case, and uh, at the time, 2009, we obtained these uh, MRIs, and the time probably were not that good. Uh, this is not a three Tesla, for sure. And uh, we came up with this diagnosis. It was a type 2 and the uh, diagnosis injury. And so in that case, we were so keen on arthroscopy that we went in, and we fixed it the regular way by just attaching that the remnant of the TFCC to the capsule and through the capsule we were thinking that the priority would go better. That was March 2010. It was a good lateral view and still the only was dorsal, that means the radius was badly dislocated normally. She was not very common, very happy with that. Besides he had lost a lot of supination. So, because of that, we thought, well, maybe we did a lousy job here. I'll try to do it better. This time, we went palmoly. We went palmoly because there was that uh, supination deficit, and any supination deficit, usually, it's much better dealt with palmoly. So, we did that, and that was the approach that we did palmoly, and over there, we found that uh, exactly that the TFCC has been a ball stuff, and we put that, uh, that um, anchor suture to provide stability. Okay, there you go, again. Right lateral, right the 
busy form, everything was right, except that patient. He was even worse. I was so embarrassed that uh, sometimes you know in those situations what, what you do is. <laughs> let me do that again. <laughs> Please, let me that opportunity. But that doesn't happen that often. But if we had, we had seen something that was very interesting. First thing, we had realized that the tendon is not in the right place. What tendon is this? Is you. The extensor capillary the tendon was not well placed, that means that it was dislocated. And further to that, that, there was some uh, fluid inside, there was some arthritis going on into the dorsum of the capsule. The dorsal capsule was filled with synovitis. It wasn't arthritic, actually, it was not, not uh, uh, what we thought. It was not a, a traumatic uh, <coughs> lesion, it was more an arthritic lesion. So, uh, that was exactly it. At the time, and even now, and probably in your, in your, your practice as well, whenever you see a dislocation or uh, instability like that, you always think on the TFCC. You see the tree, but you don't see the forest. Because the forest is much more to it than just the TFCC of ocean. There's much more to it. And that much, much more to it can be identified if you are clever enough as to realize that this may not be the only injury. So the question was how not to miss the forest when you see the tree. Because the tree is easy. The forest, how to see the forest and what's the forest. And that uh, was the basis uh, why we thought that it was uh, interesting to show an algorithm of treatment that at least uh, it could relieve my pain of having failed so much or so, so badly or so lousy. This is Ben. It's uh, Ben's diagram, the one that invented that, that idea of uh, we were looking for graphical representations of all possible complications or all possible relationships between the different factors involved in one system. It's a Ben Ben idea, and basically he worked on three factors. Uh, we will work on four factors because we thought that we had to pay attention to four. And as you can see, I'm talking all of them equally. Those are circles. That means that uh, we are assuming that the the, prof, uh, the percent the percentage of each of the factors is equal. Not as before that we said we said instability is very little and. Uh, everything else is different. This is always the same, but it doesn't need to be exactly like that. One circle is bone deformity. Yeah, a lot of patients that will have instability because of just the bone deformity, which may be ulnar or radius. Another is a cartilage defect. You may have a cartilage defect uh, in the DRUJ or, or in the ulnar carpal uh, articulation. You have a TFCC injury, which may be repairable or not, but um, still is there. It's not the only one. There may be some others, like in this case, an unstable scapefold, um, extensor capillary tendon dislocation. So there are four, four factors. <coughs> and four factors that are not there <coughs> mutually exclusively, not that they may appear, all of them, or just one or two, or combination of the three or the four. So there are 15 different options when you combine all of them, 15. And I don't want you to learn all of them because I'm not even myself, I'm interested in learning all of them. You only have to be there and pick one after the other. See, is this one, this one, this one. There are four types of injury with only one problem. There are six types of injury combining two of them. There are four types of injury that have three problems. And finally, there is one that has all of them. Of course, uh, that's getting complicated if you look at only in the numbers and the figures. But the, if you are analyzing every case to know where exactly that case belongs to, it's much easier. Because the principle of treatment in this case, and that's, I think, that's the most important slide of my talk here, is that you should treat every problem as if it was the only problem, as if it was an isolated problem, 
And even if there are two or three combinations of problems, in most of the cases you may still go there and solve the three problems or the two problems or even the four problems, quite rarely, but still it. Now having said that, so if you have a bone deformity, you need all of the, uh, usually you, you need a corrective osteotomy. And if you have a catalytic defect, you may do whatever you like at the, like a, Arthroplasty, resection of the plastic, implant of the plastic, whatever you like. If you have a TFCC injury and it's repairable, you can use a reconstruction or repair of the TFCC. You may use a tantosis sutures or may use uh, those uh, those uh, gimmicks that uh, can you use uh, like uh, arm uh, metallic uh, um, holders or whatever you want to call that. And finally, if there is an unstable extensor capillary tendon, you should replace the tendon where it belongs. And that was one of my problems. Okay, um, let's imagine that you have not one, but you have two. You have a cartilage defect and you have a, a bone deformity. In those cases, it's easy because you can do a refraction. Um, you may do a corrective osteotomy of the distal radius and you may also produce an implant or, or an arthroplasty you can do. You have a TFCC injury, you have bone deformity, you may do a corrective osteotomy, but the are you ligament reconstruction. If you have an acetyl issue and you have bone deformity, and so on and so forth, you mean, you mean again that you need to address everyone as if it was an isolated uh, problem. And most of the cases that's possible as long as uh, no, no long time has passed since. So that would call for a relocation of the, of the issue tendon plus corrective osteotomy and catalytic effect and TFCC injury would uh, require a ligament reconstruction and um, arthroplasty. And in this case, uh, you need for an unstable issue, you need to relocate that plus a prosthesis or arthroplasty of the DRUG. In this case, again, we're trying to show all the possibilities that we have uh, for treatment. The key is not to do exactly that. The key is not to forget anything, or at least to be aware of what you have. If instead of two, you have three, you may do whatever you want. But uh, in those cases, sometimes it's useful to ask yourself, don't bite off more than you can chew. Don't bite more than you can chew because that's that's human. That's human. Sometimes we want to impress by the X-ray, but uh, usually we don't impress the patient that much. And much less the one that's paying. That's another another factor because this is not uh, easy. So salvage procedures are there just to use them whenever necessary. Basically, that was uh, about what I wanted to you, to show you, except that, that we have a case over there. Being, being there waiting for us to, to, to resolve that. And the funny thing I must tell you is that I have not been sued by this patient. He's still a good friend of mine. He thinks that I'm a good surgeon. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's so easy sometimes. Well, uh, in that case, uh, how can you do it? That was the situation. Imagine again, it's a normal profile. The, Busy form is between escape with and capitate. So that was a real problem. He couldn't supinate, he couldn't pronate, he had pain all over. He was so, he was really disgusted about me. So uh, I told him the story. Well, I've met, the, uh, I miss the fact that there was that and that and that. And uh, we worked the same uh, principle. And we realized that we had a college defect. Realized that the, we, we didn't have a, a TFCC injury that the, uh, could be fixed, and we knew that the, there was an unstable issue. Of all the possibilities that we had uh, discussed, we discussed one that was the easiest, and the one that uh, we didn't have to use any prosthesis, any, any, any anything. And I went back to my to my roots, and I went to the match on the procedure. For those who doesn't know a much one procedure, actually it's a Brach procedure, except that it has uh, two different different um, peculiarities, I say. One, it matches the distal so that it ends exactly at the right uh, length, 
and provides a contact that there will be contact between the two bones, but there will be contact as wide as possible. The wider the contact, the less pressure that there will be. Not only that, what you are doing, we are doing here, some sort of a, a tendon, no, sorry, some sort of reattachment of the remnant of the DFCC to the tip of that arm. And we have done that. Now we are collecting those cases. We have a lot of those that have more than 15 years follow-up. I wouldn't say that they all are happy. I would say that they all are functioning very well. As the case that I'm showing to the, today. This is the reality that was about uh, three years after the, the original injury, the original um, case that you have seen. This is the pronospination he has got, this is flexion extension, and you will see that everything else works very well. And this is, he can, he is able of uh, holding weight and produce a full pronospination, which is okay. And he understood well that that was an easy and easy case to solve. So he was happy with me, and I was happy with him. And I was happy in a way to reconduct all this business in a solution that it may be useful to anybody. Please, if you see a tree, don't miss the forest, because there is a forest out there. And the forest is very substantial. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. So uh, as a, I guess, an extension, <clears throat> or really the impetus for our initial work on looking for a, an understanding of a carpus, it was really f to basically find a way to address the, uh, the really uncommon but certainly troublesome scapulinate uh, dissociation. Um, I mentioned, I've shown this slide before, and uh, I have a uh, conflict of interest in the uh, software we've been using. But basically, uh, this software uh, gave us a bit of an understanding to allow us to measure and uh, analyse certain components of the carpus. And with that, we've, we've identified this, uh, this critical uh, stable central column with the lunate, capitate, and the two middle metacarpals being the key to the wrist. And basically, whether there's a gap here or not, or what else is happening, probably doesn't matter as long as this, this, this um, column can remain stable. But of course, if there is a gap here, this may indicate that the stability of this column will be compromised. Um, now, we've shown that um, We've, we found there are certain isometric constraints in the wrist on the bulbar side, the lunar triquetral, uh, the long radial lunate and the uh, scapho trapezium, and the dorsal and the dorsal scapho lunate ligaments, but when there are the DIC and various other ligaments which, uh, which remain isometric. The impetus for this, for this particular um, project really is now to apply that, that theoretical basis or that uh, understanding and rationale uh, of the stable central column to provide a reconstructive procedure to, based on this proposed theory. And we've called this the anatomical front and back uh, uh, procedure. My wife thought of that mainly anaphab. <laughs> so, what are the options for the scapular limb association? There are there are many. There's the Blatt and the Brunelli, the various types. And the original modified and the wrong. Russell, slick, slam, slazed, is and tea. There are a whole range of options, which are again uh, have been pretty disappointing in some of the outcomes, uh, and certainly not that consistent. I think what's fascinating, if we look at the wrist itself, and this work came from, uh, from Fred Wern many years ago, you know, the volar lemur capsule uh, restraints are actually extremely important to control the wrist. In fact, 61% of the volar capsule, sorry, 61 of the dorsal restraint is from the volar capsule. And so any of these repairs that, that constrain mainly on the dorsal side are maybe not be, may not be adequate. Um, and in fact, the dorsal ligaments themselves provide relatively little uh, specific uh, stability. I think it's also interesting, if you look at this, this model here, so here we have a, have a scapular lunar uh, separation, um, scaphoid, radius, lunate, and capitate. It's interesting to ask which, which bones have actually moved. Have these two moved apart, these two? In fact, what, what really appears is the scaphoid and radius are pretty much uh, where they should be. And what's really happened is the lunate's gone, uh, gone on, onward. So the lunate's moved across, away from the radius, and away from the scaphoid. Now, we know there are two ligaments um, based on that work. There's the dorsal stabilizer of the, uh, of the lunate, scapular lunate dorsally, and volatily, there's the long radial lunate. And so, basically, both of these need to go to allow the lunate to move across, otherwise it'll stay put. So, we, we start to now see maybe this is a dorsal and volar injury when it uh, reaches its uh, complete perturbation. So what causes DC? And, and again, the, the, the extended lunate is, the, is one of the classic sort of, um, I guess, radiological findings, but 
Uh, dividing the scale limit alone doesn't cause a DC deformity, and this has been shown by Berger and various other, and even Mark have done some of this work too. It was only really when we divided the, this, the, the uh, scale limit, this dorsal ligament, the radioscopic cabinet, and the long radial lunate from, from Steve Lee, where the, the collapse started to work. And Scott Wolfe's been doing some of this work more recently, showing that basically the STT joint and the dorsal ligament and the long radial lunate need to go before you get this uh, classic pattern. But there are other other, other mixes as well, and certainly uh, been overstated in a recent publication in 2016, is that on the MRI standing, MRI studies, there was a significant in, uh, uh, correlation between scapular instability, i.e. DC uh, and, and uh, issues, with long radial limit injuries. So there does seem to be an important volar constraint. A lot of our current repairs are uh, largely trial and error, not theory based, they don't address all the damage, and I think any sort of biomechanical injury really should be addressed and, and uh, by your reconstruction. So if we look at our wrist and see what we find, well we find there's a uh, scapulinate uh, diastasis, it, there's a dorsal scapular subluxation, and this may in fact be one of the most important uh, mechanical uh, failures. There's also scapular flexion, and there's also lunate extension. And what we can see is that um, each of these ligaments, when they're compromised, actually produces a pathological outcome from our classic scapulinate pattern. And so we have this critical three, which are which have provided stability to the proximal row in particular, scapular trapezium, dorsal scapular lunate, and the long radial lunate. So these three ligaments actually uh, are obviously going or likely to be compromised with this sort of classic pattern of a full-blown scapular lunate dissociation. So the way to address this is to look at the issue, each of these pathological components and work out whether we can actually address them. So the scaphoid's flexed, the lunate is a scapular lunate sort of separation. The uh, lunate's extended and only translocated. And so what we've uh, now done, I guess using a range of uh, available options, is to try and restore this, the STT, joint, oops, STT ligament initially with a, a connection with the trapezium scapula. Now the problem with the, the FCR, it's in the wrong direction. The FCR is actually where the pivot point is, where the low point is, not where the, not where the pivot point is. And so it's way too on it. So we really need to bring our pivot point uh, way out here, and so I use a, a synthetic tape, and we use the FCR as, uh, to bring along the collagen. So this extends the scaphoid and, uh, and aligns it and supernates it. We then drill through the scaphoid, a la the, sort of the Brunelli type procedure, out to the dorsum, and then across, the, across to the lunate, and this, and this uh, stabilises the proximal scaphoid and closes the scaphoid interval. We then come out the front of the lunate, as we can see here, on the volar side. This is a fairly easy just to sneak across underneath the carpal tunnel, carpal tunnel contents and bring that out across to the radius and through the radius and then stabilise it dorsally. So we've got, so we've got this basically this connection between uh, uh, STT joint, scapular lunate and then long radial lunate. So all those three critical we've actually addressed by, by a single weave and there aren't any vertical um, restraints, it's out the front and back. Now we use a, you need a little guide, this is um, from the Arthrex company, this, this is quite handy to get through the, through the uh, tape here, through the, uh, the scaphoid. Label tape I think is critically important to stabilise the carpus because as I mentioned before in the question time, I think the viscoelastic properties of the, uh, of the tendon are just not adequate to, to restore stability of the carpus. This tendon shuttle now has made things passing, you can get through drill holes much easier and these little tin adhesive screws are quite handy to stabilise the, uh, the construct and so we look at this process in more, in, uh, more diagrammatically. We take a, uh, a section of FCR tendon, and really this doesn't provide, this isn't, isn't the important part, this is the important part on this uh, triscaphoid joint. Label tape, anchor, through the scaphoid. So we come through the scaphoid, here, across the dorsum, around the front, and then out dorsally, and then hold that with a, um, a tendon adhesive screw. And this provides a complete connection and, and a repair of the front and back components of the critical parts of the scaphoid injury. So uh, nothing ruins your results like uh, like follow follow up. So we had a series of ten patients uh, again, pretty standard, three minimal just diastasis uh, on CT, uh, positive Watson, abnormal angle, minimal arthritis, and well informed. Um, ten patients, minimum age up to 58, and the current follow up is now in fact minimum 24 hours. We just 24 months. We're now putting together our two year results. Which I can't tell you. This is just an example of a uh, film outstretched hand, 32 year old. Significant alignment there, malalignment there, here, fragments here, some early, early arthritic changes, but not too bad, but clearly the sort of full blown and quite unstable and quite symptomatic scapula and longitudinal instability. This is a one week post op. You can see the drill holes here through the scaphoid and the lunate, and so back anatomically, fairly pleasing. Again, no wires, the label tape holds the thing together and that stays in place. 
So here we are, pre-op, and here we are now, three months, good gap, no gap here, you can see the drill holes here. And so if we follow the, the line of these reconstruction, through this STT, scaffold, scaffold and that, then across the radius, again, stabilising the radius. I asked him how he's getting on, actually, and he said, uh, I'll show you, Doc, and can you just run that video? Um, and this is at six months, he said, but from three months, he said his wrist felt pretty, really, pretty good. So I think the ability to do push-ups, and again, I didn't ask him to do this, he often, so I wasn't pushing him, he often. Um, I think this is a pleasing, now he said he lost some motion, but this is only six months post-op. Now this is our, our, all our results for the, um, for the scaphalonic uh, gap, again, up to nearly six mils, uh, some only just three mils, again, coming down nicely, a little bit of variation, but again, this is a two-dimensional gap, not 3D. Uh, flexion, again, uh, from the reconstruction, we lose some flexion, but then it gradually comes up, and this has continued to improve after the 24 months. Again, extension comes down and comes up again, and grip strength has steadily improved to nearly 100% in, in, in some of them, but certainly uh, a lot better than it was. Uh, looking at our scaffold and our angle, again, a little disappointing in terms of how much we've been able to correct, but certainly all have improved quite substantially. And in particular, this one here, which went from a DC to a VC, which I'll show you shortly, but pretty much all of them going from well inside, well inside the, the, the ugly, ugly spot to down towards the, uh, the target range. And 47 degrees is where we want, but we'll accept between 30 and 60. So, so these are some, some other examples here. Again, pretty much all the guys can uh, just push, you can just fire up those bottom two videos. This guy was dragon boat racing. This guy was dragon boat racing at, um, at three months, which I wasn't very impressed with. Not bothering too much? Yeah, okay, that's fine. So, uh, what complications? Well, there's always some complications, I guess, in many, but we've had no loss of correction, infection, or excessive stiffness. We did have one patient that I mentioned, I'll show you the slides, where we overcorrected her to a v, from a DC to a VC sosis. And what, this actually caused extraneous uh, ulnar carpal impaction. Now, I'll present this in, the, in my paper later on, so I'll just skip zip through this fairly quickly, but I don't know where they came from. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's your Mac back there. That's, that's a... <laughs> anyway, 42 year old, she would really like this. 42 year old, scattered in a tear, and that, that's not how she was behaving, I might say. Um, tear corrected, anatomical correction, and this is a, this is a result set. So, this, this is a pre operative uh, 3D uh, images we can see here wide gap here, a lunatic, lunatic extension, um, so, lunar fle yeah, so DC deformity and scaphoid flexion. This is her, her post-op uh, pictures, or intro pictures uh, showing the fluoroscopy. So you can see the drill holes here, nice gap down, nicely aligned. And this is an x-rays at the week. And I think that I was actually fairly pleased with that. It's nicely aligned, the carpus is back in place, holding it nicely. She was pretty sore in the, part, in the cast and required one cast change, but when I took the plaster off at six weeks, this is what I found, which I was actually dumbfounded by. And this is really leads on from Mark's talk a minute ago about this dorsal the distal radial ulnar joint, what, what's actually going on here? And I couldn't understand why the distal radial ulnar joint should go from stable to unstable while in the cast. And I, again, we'll, we'll discuss this in the next paper, so I don't want to cover that too much just now. But I think what basically happened was, if you look at her preoperative CT scan here, we can see there's actually quite good space space here, and we're not sitting here. This is a CT scan post-reconstruction. You can see the two dorsal screw, screw holes, which are, or drill holes, with a nicely closed scapulonic gap. The lunate's flexed, but what's happening here, this is all now crowded. So by, by flexing the lunate, maybe the volar lunate has actually now increased the prominence of the carpus and actually push the, push the, um, uh, the, the ulna dorsally. So we've actually created an ulna carpal impaction because of the overcorrection of the lunate. I shortened the ulna and the, and the, and the uh, ulna came back, back, in, back into place. She has some residual uh, dorsal, uh, some front rotations. I've done a dorsal and volar release and she's now... So uh, as a consequence of, um, of presenting the, the outcomes, some of the bad outcomes, here she is now with a shortened ulna. Uh, we can see the reconstruction here. She's quite pleased with her outcome, but she, um, she's not actually... This wouldn't be her choice, by the way. Um, stable wrist, she's reasonably happy, but it's been a bit disappointing. But if this is our worst outcome, but our, our carpus is stable, but the, uh, there's been some problems secondary. So overall, in terms of scaphoid lunate dissociation, um, we've defined the injury, and I think quantitative CT analysis is important. We need to apply a injury-based strategy, and I think this three is the carpal trifecta of the dorsal scaphoid lunate, the STT, and the, and the LRL, uh, as at least one, one part of the component. 
And I think any, any approach needs to be logic and theory based and uh, long term outcomes. So one final picture, I think what's fascinating is that the 3D, here we have the connections of the scapholinate uh, ligament, um, which we can now reduce manually. And if you look at this, uh, this, picture, this picture here, so here's the scapholinate uh, joint um, uh, displaced, preoperative, and we can see the gap here is about, seven, is about uh, uh, 17 millimetres from the uh, insertion of the dorsal scapholinate ligament. If we manually, manually reduce the scaphoid on the computer, we can see that this goes down to seven. So there's been a 10 millimetre gap separation in the dorsal scapholinate. And yet, on the um, 2D picture, it's only a 4.5 millimetre gap, which we then reduce down to two. So I think what the big problem we're missing in a lot of these scaphoid gaps is that this is a three-dimensional deformity, not a two-dimensional deformity. And I don't think that'll, can you run, will that video run at the bottom? And you can see the deformity that actually the scaphoid does. So that's where it starts. And by, many, by reducing it on the computer, we can actually get an idea where it should be going. Thank you. What do you say about the difficult scaphoid? Uh, well, Peter Hales, who was one of the members that started this West Australian Hand Surgery Society, and who was one of the people that encouraged me to do hand surgery, is now assisting me. He retired last week. And before I headed off to Europe to give this talk a month ago, I said, Pete, have you got any advice? And quick as a flash, he said, they're all potentially difficult. Here ends my uh, talk. <laughs> so I'm going to share with you some of the ones that have stopped and made me think. And there are many more. These just got on the on the talk list. Proximal poles, the proximal half is simple. It's the proximal half of the proximal half that's the trouble. Okay, the small little one. And people get worried about it because they're avascular. They're said to have a delayed union. And uh, Greg Bain has gone. I'm sure we'd have a bit of a discussion on that if he was here. Increased risk of non-union. Disintegration, that's what we all call this avascular proximal pole, it literally collapses and extrudes everywhere. But if you've got an intact proximal pole and you've got intact cartilage, they will unite the same as distal fractures of the scaphoid. Took a while to work that out. So here's an open technique. This is the way I used to do it a long time ago, possibly six years ago. Too many HCS screws. It's like only 20 years ago, these patients. A little bit of bone graft if you needed it. Don't violate the proximal pole. And they heal. You put two screws in to stop the rotation, stabilise it, it's freehand. There was no cannulated screws in those days, it was just freehand. You got one bite out of it. We looked at 19, and what we found is there was a delay in surgery. Some of them were up to five to six years. They still united but the proximal pole had a different shape, a kind of atrophy as it remodeled. The avascular pole arthroscopically, you can see it's vascular distally, I've cut it out, fixed it, put a bone graft into it. They will unite. The small proximal pole, look at this, they're 1.2 millimeter K-wise. Look how small that proximal pole is. If you fix it properly and bone graft it, that will also unite. Here it is, the wires have been removed at 12 weeks. And here it is at five months. I looked at 48 arthroscopic bone grafts and internal fixations. 18 were proximal poles, 30 were waste. Range of motion mean pole up at two years, uh, ranging over five and a half years. Surprisingly, palmar flexion and dorsiflexion were roughly the same. 125 degrees, so they're not normal. And the proximal pole healed just as well as the waist. That healed just as quickly and just as reliably. I had two revision operations out of the 18 proximal poles. But what I can say is that I was responsible for both of those. <coughs> Initially I used to rely on the image intensifier to make sure I picked up the proximal pole. But when the proximal pole is so small, 
the image intensifier is unreliable. <clears throat> so I learned that you had to turn the scope around and actually see the wires going in to the proximal pole. And there's a few tricks with that sometimes. So yeah, I, just put, I have this policy, if I've done it once and it's failed, then don't do it the same way again. So I reverted to the old technique of two screws, proximal pole and united. The second one that I failed with was inadequate excision of the non-union. I failed to appreciate the obliquity and didn't get it all. And again, don't repeat the same operation if you think you've done it once or... So in this case, I went to a vascularized medial femoral condyle bone graft. And this is something that I used all the time before arthroscopic bone grafts. And here's a picture. Basically, you cut out the non-union, fix it with a wire, cut out a piece of bone from the medial femoral bone, uh, medial femoral condyle, pick whatever geometry or vessel you've got, drop it into the scapoid non-union after you've cut it out, and anastomose it into the vessels. And, and that works incredibly well. But the problem is it's a much bigger operation with much more scarring, more pain. So distal third of the scapoid involving the triscapoid joint. Now I looked at that and I thought, what the heck do I do with this one? This is a little bit unusual. You can see it on both views. So I started out arthroscopically and just kept going arthroscopically. Cut it out, put the wires in, bone grafted it, packed it down, put some fiber and glue on it, and it went on to heal. But this is very slow. There it goes. Four and a half months after his arthroscopic bone graft, he turns up with a fractured distal radius. Here he is. So the next thing about these patients are, I wouldn't say they're difficult, but they're young, they don't listen, they do what they want, they take their casts off, they take their splints off. And about 15 years ago, I could safely say that was an adolescent or young male. But now the females are catching up very quickly. No difference. This is one that um, a colleague sent me, and I'm very grateful for the, the cases that I get because you know, this is how you learn and you challenge yourself. This is an infected non-union and the proximal pole is disintegrated. It's had two operations, bone graft and IV antibiotics. So what the heck do you do with that? I mean, not much you can do with the proximal pole. So I went in and took a rib. This is Michael Sandow's operation. Huh? He popularised this. I don't know if I'm doing as well as you, but it's a bit of freehand carving to get up the right shape and whack it in. And here he is. You can only see the interface between the bone and the distal scapegoat. You can't see the cartilage. And I've used this on numerous occasions, and I thank Michael because it does get you out of trouble. I prefer it to taking a vascularized medial femoral osteochondral graft. I can't see the sense in that. That's not a normal wrist by a long shot. But it's better than a partial fusion. He doesn't need that yet. He doesn't need a fusion yet. And it's got out of jail for a while. I don't know how long it'll last, but it's been good. You know? Pardon? Sorry? The tattoos. You know, tattoos are a really interesting point. Watch this one. I'll talk about that in a second. This is a fractured proximal pole with a sagittal fracture in it that I got early. So, you know, what do you do with that? Opened it up and it's in two pieces. Because I got it earlier, it went on to heal. Um, what do I do with tattoos? Um, first of all, people are very emotionally attached to their tattoos, a lot of them. So what I normally do is I, I try to get them as perfect as I can so that they heal well. But even if you get them perfectly, sometimes they shift a bit with the scar. But the best fun is when you're doing free flaps, you can take a tattoo with a skull on it and put it somewhere else. <laughs> I've got a free one, a second metacarpal reconstructed like that with a lateral arm flap with his skull in his web space. He loved it. <laughs> I have one in the in your brain and in the lab that they have the into two that says that man. Sorry? It says that man. That man. <laughs> The bloke I took the, <laughs> <laughs> the, the free flap with the skull off actually blew his hand up with a bomb. He was in Los Angeles. 
Um, so that went on to heal, and I was very lucky with that, I guess. I worried what was going to happen with that one. This is one that really pushed me. Um, down the southwest of Australia, he injures his wrist, he gets an x-ray, it's poor quality, poor penetration, not a good lateral. And it's passed by the radiologist down there as normal, and he turns up at six months with this transradial styloid dorsal perilunate dislocation. That's what it looks like. So he's moving quite well. His capitate was just hinging on his top of his radius. Couldn't get it out, so put a distractor on him, distracted him to get it back together, screwed it, had a little bit of bone graft, thought I was doing pretty well, closed him up. But at five months, he's got pain, and this is another problem with the scaphoid. Has it united? In most cases, trabecular bone crossing it is a fair index that it's healed. But sometimes when the trabecular bone is grinding into the trabecular bone, it creates the illusion the trabecular bone is crossing it. So, you know, if you don't know what's going on, the only thing you can do is get more information. The first way is to wait and then take further imaging and see if something changes or to do something different. So what I did with him was, whoa, I don't know where that, that's like those lips. I don't know where that one came from. <laughs> that's ugly. Arthroscopy. Arthroscopy revealed that it wasn't healed. So rarely, rarely, if you don't know, put a scope in your face. Not often, it's very rare. The bone was very soft. There was extensive arthrofibrosis. And I really didn't want to open him up again. So what I did was I did a combined open arthroscopic procedure, cut it out, wired it, packed it with bone, <clears throat> Don't ask me why I did that, it just felt right at the time, there was no logic to it. And fortunately when you trust your intuition, sometimes it works. And here he is at three years, by far not a normal joint, but better than anything else I could give him. And what a journey to get it back in, what a journey to solve the problem of has it united or hasn't it united, and what a journey to use a combined open arthroscopy, because you can use both quite effectively. Why combine? Because they had to pull the screws and metal out. Here's a 29-year-old male with football injury. Initially advised it was a sprain, left for six weeks. He was placed in a cast for eight weeks. <coughs> Didn't heal, so he had a volar plate. This was in vogue, and, and I thank the people that sent me this case, because uh, it was challenging. He had a non-union, the plate and screws have been removed. He presented five and a half years after his injury. <clears throat> and this is what it looked like. I mean, he's got a non-union and it looks like the proximal pole is fractured, but in reality it hasn't. It's the screw hole from the plate. So once again, cut it out, packed it with bone growth. And he goes on to unite. After. So it's not normal, he's got a reduced range of motion, but at this stage we don't have to resect his scapegoat or do a partial fusion. This is another one that I found very interesting. A microtrabecular fracture of the scaphoid and the radial styloid. It was a bit like Mark's talk, that guy in the background when LeBron injured his wrist, just keep playing. So you know, it's a microtrabecular fracture. But then, he turns up, three weeks later he simply hits the football and he has a grossly unstable transscapoid perilunate fracture subluxation. And again, very unstable. The trick is just to pin the lunate to the radius, it stabilizes it and then you can fix the scapoid without difficulty. An arthroscopic top-up graft. This is an AFL footballer. He fractured his proximal pole, a young player, the lead. I've changed the colour of the Guernsey so you can't trace it. Uh, in 2013, he fractures his proximal <coughs> pole. It's put in a cast for six weeks. In 2014, it's bone grafted and internally fixed by a very good surgeon. 
In 2015, he gets a bone graft and another internal fixation with two screws by another good surgeon. Scaphoids don't treat you well sometimes. It doesn't matter who you are. You know, if you do them, you're going to get hurt occasionally. He's referred for a free femoral bone graft. That kind of makes sense. But what I did to him was simply cut out the scar from around the screws, pack it with bone, put graft on it, and he went on to heal. You get a great view with this thing. Here you can see he's bridged across and he went back to play football at three months. So I just shared with you scapegoats that go wrong. I, I, these, the, one of the things that is really useful is anecdotal stories, but about 15 years ago, a young, a young boy, he was about 17 or 18, a skateboarder, pretty fragile, high energy, adrenaline junkie, came into the office with a non-union of the waist of his scaphoid. And I put a trapezoidal bone graft into it, and uh, he took his splint off and went skateboarding in two weeks. And he came back, and I said, don't worry, we'll fix it. So he put another trapezoidal bone graft into it, and as what happens with these grafts, sometimes they heal distally, but they won't heal proximally. And I said, don't worry, we'll fix it. And the week after that, his mother rang me and he said, she said, he's committed suicide. So these kids, you know, that sent me on a journey to try and work out what is the best way to fix this thing. How do you get them right as fast as you can? How do you get them back on their feet as fast as you can? And, uh, you know, they're fragile. They're, they're some of them have just got their apprenticeships, their parents have spent their whole life working on them, and then a skateboard takes them. Now, this kid may have committed suicide anyway, but the point is we don't have the luxury of mucking around with these people for 12 or 18 months. And what I think we should all be doing is going out and spreading the word that anybody that has a wrist sprain needs a diagnosis, especially in high-impact sport injuries. So it's up to us to stop us having to do arthroscopic bone grafts and vascularising your femoral bone grafts. That's what I think. Thank you.